vibrations. The Sedona Files, Book One by Christine Pope. Published by Dark Valentine Press. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. For mature audiences only. Chapter 5. To my surprise, I actually overslept. Paul was already up and showered by the time I staggered out of bed. I suppose the excitement of the previous day had taken more out of me than I'd thought. But we still had plenty of time to make our rendezvous, even with having to get breakfast before we set out for Griffith Park. The day promised to be cooler than it had been earlier in the week, with lowering clouds and spotty drizzle. So I was glad I'd picked up a lightweight blazer from one of the sales racks at Kohl's. I pulled it a little more tightly around me as we locked the motel room and headed down to the car. We'd already agreed to grab a bite at the Caro's down the street from the motel, and there didn't seem to be much for either of us to say as Paul drove the half-mile to the restaurant. He ordered coffee, and I ordered tea, and an uneasy little silence fell. I pretended to be absorbed in reading my menu, but I noticed him glancing at his watch and frowning. "'It's all right,' I said then. "'We'll make it there in plenty of time. It's actually better if we wait a bit so traffic has time to clear.' That's not it, he replied, and glanced out the window before focusing back on me. I was supposed to be giving a lecture right now. Oh, damn. I'd almost forgotten that he was here in Southern California in an official capacity, that he'd essentially bailed out on what had to have been an important gig. I'm sure if you explained, I already did. I sent the symposium chairman a text while you were in the shower, apologizing but saying that some important personal business had come up. Still, I don't like reneging on my obligations. Sorry, I murmured. Probably he hadn't meant to make me feel guilty, but I couldn't help the wave of self-reproach that went over me just then. I should have left well enough alone, told Otto to go stuff himself. And just where the hell was Otto anyway? Nice of him to get me into this mess and then take himself off to another plane of existence. I wished there were some Bureau of Spirit guides where I could make a complaint and ask for a replacement caseworker or something. But I knew that wasn't going to happen. Don't beat yourself up. Paul's tone had gentled a little, as if he'd just realized he might have sounded a bit too harsh. I wanted to know about this. It's the timing that's unfortunate. That's for sure. And then I sat up a little straighter, as I suddenly remembered I had my own obligations to deal with. Not as pressing as Paul's, but I did have two clients coming to see me this afternoon. Thank God it was only two. Fridays were always the lightest days for me. The waitress showed up then with our drinks, and we placed our orders. Steak and eggs for him, a vegetarian omelet for me. Not that I was a vegetarian, but I'd never been big on eating meat in the morning. Obviously, Paul, raised on a ranch as he'd been, didn't have the same scruples. After she'd left, I asked, Can I borrow your phone? Why? I explained about my clients. He listened and nodded, but said, It's probably better if you don't use this phone to contact them. We have no idea whether they're under surveillance. You don't think all of my clients are under surveillance, do you? That's a bit much. For a second or two, He didn't say anything, but only worked away at customizing his coffee. Two little containers of half and half, no sugar. He swirled the resulting toffee-colored liquid with a spoon and replied, Persephone, I'm afraid you don't have a very good idea of what they're capable of. I didn't much like the sound of that, but I also didn't like his insinuation that I was some innocent who didn't know what was going on in the world. Hey, I've seen Oliver Stone movies, you know. He laughed then and shook his head. Not quite the same thing, but point taken. Anyway, I think it's a better idea if you use a payphone. They'll still be able to trace the call back here if they really are tracking your clients, but we should be all right if we keep on the move. Oh, that was really reassuring. And a great idea. Except in Southern California, payphones were about as rare as the El Segundo Blue Butterfly, what with everyone's defection to cell phones pretty much complete— But then the waitress came by again, ostensibly to refresh Paul's coffee. He hadn't seemed to notice her giving him some serious sidelong glances under her heavily mascaraed lashes, but I sure had. Some territorial instinct made me want to slap the coffee pot right out of her hands, which was just silly. 
I didn't have any claim on Paul, but I managed to keep my voice level as I inquired whether there was a payphone, and it turned out there actually was one, down the hall by the bathrooms. So I excused myself, after the waitress was safely away, and made my calls. Normally, I would have been worried about getting an actual person on the line, but my Friday clients were skittish entertainment industry types who let everything go to voicemail. In the past, that behavior had irritated me to no end, although I was certainly glad of it now. At any rate, it was simple enough to leave a message saying I'd had a family emergency come up and that I'd let them know about rescheduling when I could. Not that I expected them to take me up on the offer. Michael Horowitz had his entire life set by clockwork, and if he couldn't see me at 3.45 sharp on Friday afternoon, well then, he'd just wait until the next week. And Lindsay McKilvey probably was so embroiled in meetings that she'd barely notice not being able to come in and see me. Knowing her, she'd simply schedule a few more meetings to fill the gap. Hollywood types could be exhausting, but they did pay well. The waitress was loitering at the table when I returned. I practically had to push past her so I could slide into the booth, so I sent her a sideways glare. She pretended not to notice and went on. Oh, New Mexico. Like where they have the Grand Canyon and everything? I saw Paul wince and guessed I didn't have to worry about too much competition from the waitress. Not that I could claim to know him all that well, but what little I did know told me he probably didn't have much patience for ignorance. Actually, that's Arizona, he said. He looked over at me and asked, Were you able to make your calls? Yes, thanks. Some devilish impulse prompted me to add, you really need to be more careful with your cell phone, dear. We're not always lucky enough to be someplace where there's a payphone. Both Paul and the waitress caught the deer, but whereas she scowled and then mumbled, I'll check on your order. Before stalking away, he only grinned and shook his head. A little glint I hadn't seen before flickered in his hazel eyes before he said, Yes, dear, and picked up his coffee. I fought back a grin of my own as I reached for a packet of sugar. For some inexplicable reason, I suddenly didn't feel quite so nervous about the day ahead. Griffith Park, the site where the observatory was located, already had cars and people swarming the place when we got there, even though we were a little early and the place wouldn't officially open for ten more minutes. Still, we managed to snag one of the last parking spaces in the lot at the top of the hill, which made me breathe a secret sigh of relief. You could park farther away on one of the roads leading up to the observatory, but from any of them it was quite a hike, and my feet were still tired from all the chasing around in heels I'd done the night before. So what does this guy look like? I asked, after we'd locked the car and joined the throngs massing outside the front entrance in anticipation of the doors opening. I'd forgotten how busy the place could be. Even on a weekday, schools regularly brought up busloads of students, and today was no exception. I winced a little at the noise emanating from one particularly boisterous group of fifth graders and tried to remind myself that I'd been that young once. I have no idea, Paul replied. What? His gaze swept the area briefly before returning to me. We've only communicated through texts and a couple of forums online. I've never met him in person. So how do you know he's who he says he is? I crossed my arms and made my own quick scan of the crowds around us. No one looked suspicious, or even like a government agent in disguise. But that didn't mean much. Although I guessed the man who had chased us through the parking structure at the Sheraton Universal probably hadn't disguised himself as a harried elementary school teacher. I suppose I don't, Paul said, but he didn't appear all that worried. If this has all been an elaborate ruse to gain my confidence, however... I'll be surprised. What makes you say that? Up until now, my movements have been very easy to track. That glint was back in his eyes. I don't do much to conceal my activities. I speak at symposiums and conferences. I do book signings. Anyone who wanted to find me or communicate with me really wouldn't have to go to the elaborate lengths my contact has gone. You wrote a book? I inquired, a little impressed despite myself. You've never heard of investigating the unknowable? I shook my head. Intersections of belief? I lifted my shoulders. Oh, well, 
he said, in deprecating tones. They're quite popular in some circles. At any rate, within the UFO community, I'm fairly well known. No need for cloak and dagger. A federal agent could have come along and picked me up at any time. Which leads me to believe my unseen friend is most definitely not working for the government. I had to admit that argument made some sense. So, if you've never met, how is he going to know who we are? I assume from my book jacket photograph, or the photograph on my website, or... Raising my hands in mock surrender, I said, Okay, okay, I get it. You're a big celebrity. He shrugged. Well, I don't know about that. Big enough. So where are we supposed to meet exactly? Paul smiled then. A few of the women in our vicinity shot him admiring glances, but he appeared not to notice. If he had been one of the other men of my acquaintance, I probably would have said that he affected not to notice, but he truly didn't seem to realize the effect he had on the female half of the population. Too busy looking for aliens, probably. He replied to my question by asking another one. Where else but at the cafe at the end of the universe? It was far too soon after that omelet to even think of eating anything else, but I did get some iced tea, and Paul bought bottled water so as to justify our taking a table up against one of the bank of windows that gave the cafe a breathtaking panorama of Hollywood, downtown Los Angeles, and beyond. The overcast had lifted a little, but the breeze coming off the ocean was still brisk. So soon after opening, the cafe was almost deserted. Later, after people had worked up a thirst from tromping up and down the observatory's innumerable stairs, the place would collect quite a crowd. Right then, however, except for a young woman with a laptop and an enormous cup of coffee, and another woman with improbable heels who was nursing a soda and rubbing the ball of her foot, we had the place to ourselves. A minute ticked by, and then another. I glanced at my watch. The contact was almost ten minutes late. What if he doesn't come? I asked. Then I suppose I can take you to a planetarium show, Paul replied imperturbably. Seriously. I am being serious. I've heard they're very good. If it had been anyone else, I probably would have given him a good dose of annoyed side-eye. But despite having slept in the same room together, I didn't feel as if I knew Paul well enough to do such a thing. I settled for scowling and sipping at my iced tea as I stared out at the L.A. skyline. Far off in the distance, I thought I saw the faintest glimmer of gold as the clouds near the coast parted and allowed a few rays of sunlight to catch in the waves off Santa Monica. "'Who's she?' came an unfamiliar voice, and I turned away from the window to see a scruffy-looking individual with a few days' growth of beard and wearing an oversized military surplus jacket staring down at us. This is Ms. O'Brien, whom I mentioned in my message, Paul said. The young man, who was probably in his middle twenties at most, even with the beard, summoned up a scowl that put mine to shame. I didn't know you were going to bring her. Hi, nice to meet you, I said, and stuck out a hand. He recoiled as if I had hit him with a stun gun, and instead pulled out the table's free chair so he could sit down. Pointedly ignoring me, he said to Paul, how do you know she can be trusted? Of all the... I'm right here, you know, I remarked, withdrawing my hand so I could cross my arms. We wouldn't know about any of this if it weren't for her, Paul pointed out. Although his voice still sounded level, a little twitch at the edge of his jawline seemed to indicate he was just a bit irritated. The stranger shrugged. Okay, fine. He swung the battered leather messenger bag he wore over one shoulder onto the table, I barely had time to get my iced tea out of the way. A second later, and it would have been splattered all over my front. A few choice words rose to my lips, but I decided it was probably better for me to keep quiet and not provoke him. No wonder the guy hid out on message boards and forums and didn't get out much. I'd seen better manners from a two-year-old. He pulled a laptop out of the messenger bag, opened up the computer, and began typing in some rapid-fire commands. What exactly he was doing, I couldn't tell, because the strings of characters that moved across the screen didn't look like anything I'd ever seen before. Not that that necessarily meant much, since my level of computer skills allowed me to set up spreadsheets for my business and hack some basic CSS for the WordPress install on my website. And that was about it. There's been a lot of chatter, 
he said. You two stirred something up. Sounds like they've got people all over L.A. looking for you. Wonderful. So much for doing a little Nancy Drew work and then heading home at the end of the day. I knew that Ginger's and my schedules didn't always overlap, so most likely she probably hadn't yet even realized that I hadn't come home last night. But if I were absent too much longer, she'd notice I was missing. And since Ginger wasn't the type to sit around and do nothing, she very likely would call the police. Or, even worse, my mother. I shuddered a little and made myself focus on the scruffy stranger, who, I just realized, had never even told us his name. Any concrete leads? Paul asked. Not that I can tell. They searched her apartment and her office, but I don't think they found anything. They're more than a little pissed at the way you disappeared into thin air. Well, that was something. Who knew I had such a talent for a life of crime? Maybe I'd gone into the wrong line of work. Psychic powers could probably be a big asset when robbing banks or running Ponzi schemes. Good, said Paul, with a sort of grim satisfaction. Then, Persephone, why don't you explain what brought you to see me? I really didn't want to. Not with the way I could practically feel the irritation pouring off the stranger in waves. Funny how I could sense his emotions so easily, when Paul might as well have been a closed book. That was just how it worked. My abilities ebbed and flowed based on the vibrations of those around me. And Paul was one of those I tended to regard as a neutral energy, one that didn't give off any discernible tells. Unlike this young man, whose name I suddenly knew was Jeff Makowski, and who I also knew ran his underground operations from a ramshackle craftsman house in the Silver Lake District. I thought you already told him, I protested. Just the bare bones. Go on. A strong pull of my iced tea to fortify me. And then I said, Well, Jeff... I had a client come to see me yesterday. He blinked when I said his name, but otherwise didn't react. And he told me his girlfriend was possessed by an alien. From there, I went into as complete a description of my encounter with Alex Hathaway as I could remember. When I got to the part where Alex said his girlfriend had changed after getting a spray tan, Jeff held up a hand to stop me. A spray tan. That's what he said. Jeff drummed his fingers on the tabletop and looked over at Paul. Thoughts? Not sure. Could be something in the tanning spray. Easy way to get into our system through the pores. The aliens could have infected the spray with a virus that allows them to infiltrate a human system. You mean like the black oil? I cut in. It had been a recurring plot device in the X-Files, a gooey substance the aliens used to infect people with some sort of mind and body-altering virus. Both men's heads swiveled toward me, staring as if I were the one who had suddenly sprouted antennae. Hey, I said, you're not the only ones who watched the X-Files, you know? From Jeff, I got a sense of extremely grudging respect, while Paul was still a blank, although he did give me an encouraging nod. Okay, Jeff said, so we've got the possibility of the spray at a tanning salon being contaminated with an alien virus. Do you know which one? Which one what? Which tanning salon she went to? The exasperation was back. He gave me a glance of narrow-eyed irritation as he added, Try to keep up. I didn't have time to count to ten, so instead I sipped my iced tea. That way, I wouldn't risk throwing the cup at his head. I'm afraid my session with Mr. Hathaway wasn't that in-depth. I'll see if I can look him up. You have an address? No. Since I didn't charge him for the session, I didn't get any more information than his name— I did get the impression that he was local, so I'm guessing the salon his girlfriend went to was also in the area. I'll look him up, see if I can narrow it down. He began tapping away again, and I lifted my eyebrows at Paul. He only shrugged, but something in the tilt of his head told me he expected me to show some patience. All right, I'd try to be patient, but if Mr. Makowski started slinging insults again, I wouldn't be responsible for my actions. Uh Uh-oh. Both Paul and I looked questioningly at him. He stopped typing and turned the laptop around so we could both see the screen. That your guy? I stared at the image, fighting the sick sensation that rose in my stomach. The face was slack and pale, bloodless. At first glance, you barely saw the black hole in his temple, or the ring of livid flesh that surrounded it. 
Now I understood why I had sensed that wave of cold when Alex's shoulder brushed mine. I'd known something terrible was about to happen, but that could have meant a variety of things, from a fatal car crash to an IRS audit. And while I didn't feel quite ready to acknowledge the connection between his visit with me and his subsequent murder, it was clear that he hadn't lived more than a few hours after I had spoken with him. The omelet somersaulted in my gut, and I stood up from the table. I knew I had to get some fresh air or risk being sick right then and there. Without a word, I rushed for the door and then made my way out onto the terrace that ran alongside the west wall of the cafe. A cool breeze, tangy with ocean salt, washed over my face, and I took in deep gulps of air, willing the food to stay down, trying with all my might to keep that image of Alex Hathaway's blank, dead face from my mind. I wasn't very successful at the latter, although the nausea subsided after a few seconds. Persephone. I glanced over my shoulder and saw Paul standing a few feet away. Are you all right? I nodded. I'm, well, fine isn't exactly the right word, but I'll manage. It was just unexpected. For a few seconds, Paul didn't say anything. He stepped toward me, then hesitated. The police report says he was found this morning, but apparently he was killed yesterday in the late afternoon. I know. A flicker of surprise moved over his features. You saw the time of death? I didn't have to. I shifted so I faced him fully. There were a few people out on the terrace, but none of them were close enough to hear what we were saying. I knew when he left my office that he didn't have long to live. You never told me that. Because I hoped I was wrong. I shoved my icy fingers into my jacket pockets. I'm not 100% accurate. I make mistakes. Not often, but I do. And so when I felt the cold when I touched him, I tried to tell myself it was nothing. Couldn't you have warned him? There was no reproach in his voice that I could hear, only a desire to understand my actions. I could have, and I doubt he would have believed me, considering I struck out pretty spectacularly during our session. Anyway, if I've learned anything, it's when it's your time, you go. This isn't like giving advice on whether to go out on a second date or buy a certain stock. Death can't be cheated. Again, he was silent. After a pause, he nodded. All right, are you ready to go back in? Sure, as long as Jeff doesn't bring up any more show and tell. And just how did he get that photo anyway? It had to have come from the LAPD's servers. And I'm sure he'd like to know how you learned his name, Paul replied, looking unruffled. I suppose you both will just have to acknowledge that you have certain talents and leave it at that. Fair enough. I followed him back inside the cafe and resumed my seat. To my surprise, Jeff seemed rather subdued. I'd been sure he'd mock me for my precipitous flight from the table, but maybe even he had his limits. Right, he said, as if I hadn't interrupted the conversation at all. I got the address, and it turns out there are four tanning salons within a quarter-mile radius of Alex Hathaway's apartment. One called Sun Gold, another called Paradise Tanning, one named Golden Age, and a day spa called Lotus. I must have let out a little sound of surprise, because both men shot questioning glances in my direction. Um, I go to Lotus, I explained, and then, as they sent disbelieving looks at my fish-belly pale skin... Not for tanning. I get my eyebrows done there. Eyebrows, Jeff repeated, as his own lifted slightly. Good eyebrows are very important, I assured him, and he made a sound of disgust. So you know the people there? Paul cut in. Yes, I've been going for the past two years. Good. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out his cell phone, then slid it across the table toward me. I think it's time you made an emergency eyebrow appointment. Look for other chapters in this series on the Christine Pope Author YouTube channel. New episodes drop Tuesdays and Saturdays.